come to the end of Hebrews chapter 10 and we, we move into Hebrews chapter 11, we've reached, uh, in a sense, a dividing line in the mind uh, of the writer of this letter. Kind of like a, a fork in the road. The place where, where we must choose which way we'll go. And the writer tells us that there are those who, who unwisely choose to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ and who continue in their unbelief even after they've heard the truth. They, they abandon the only means of our salvation provided to us by God knowing that they will face, face his judgment. No face his judgment for rejecting the sacrifice of his son. So the writer encourages his readers not to throw away their faith. Not to shrink back in unbelief. Because he says, if you do, it is an indication, it is a proof that you never had genuine faith to begin with. Stern warning for all of us. But, the writer adds, in verse 39 of chapter 10, we're not like that. We do believe. We have faith. The right kind of faith. Because everybody has faith in something. We can't see the air we breathe, yet we believe that with every breath we receive oxygen that we need to sustain our life. Well, that's faith. It's actually faith in God. Faith in His design in our lives. Every time we cross a bridge, every time we go through a tunnel, we exercise faith, don't we? We don't ask to see the list of materials that were used in the construction, even before we cross. We don't ask if it complies with the standards and with the building codes, or if it meets the weight limits required by the law. Instead, we entrust ourselves, we trust our lives to people that we don't even know. We exercise faith in their ability to keep us safe. But the kind of faith that the writer of Hebrews is talking about goes beyond that. It's a different kind of faith. It's the kind of faith that we see talked about in Ephesians chapter 2 where it is called the gift of God. Faith to believe in the word of God. Faith to believe in its truth. Faith to believe that Jesus Christ truly is our Lord and the only way to God. Our only Savior. Faith that God puts in our heart. So now, the writer says, verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 11, Here is what that kind of faith is like. Faith that comes from God. That kind of faith is grounded in assurance. Hypostasis. In steadiness of mind. We're settled. Confident. In our belief. We're not tossed around by doubt. But instead we take God at his word. And this word, hypostasis, is a word that was sometimes used in connection with business documents that were written as a guarantee of a transaction. So we're confident that as we read the word of God, that it is guaranteed To be true. Since it is guaranteed by God who cannot lie. Though we've never seen him, we still believe him. We believe his word. Which really is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And though following Christ brings pain, suffering, 
sometimes in a variety of ways. Rejection, persecution, sometimes even death. Still, we follow him. Still, we believe. That is the depth of the assurance, of the confidence that we have in him. But that word, hypostasis, had another meaning. It referred to the substructure. What lies beneath the floor. The supporting beams. The confidence that we have that as we walk across the room, we're not going to fall through the floor. That is what our faith is like. It is our confidence that we won't fall through the floor. That we're sure of the things that we have hoped for in Christ. El pizzo in Greek. We fully expect, without any doubt, without any wavering, just like walking across the floor, that we can put the full weight of our confidence in Christ. We trust in the soundness of what we do not now see, but we know to be true. The conviction, the writer says, elenkos, the proof. What proof? Proof that's in our heart of those things that are not seen. And so, We live our lives according to what we know to be true, but what we cannot see, but we put our faith into action by building our lives on Christ as we wait for him to come and to bring to pass everything in his time. That's faith in God. That's faith in Christ. And it's that kind of faith that has enabled men and women over the centuries to achieve moral and spiritual victory over the sins in their life, to triumph over evil and to live and to die faithfully trusting in Jesus who is the only foundation of our faith, the only foundation upon which we can build a relationship with God. And despite what some people may think, faith in Christ is not a leap into the dark. It is a leap into his arms. So we press on. We press on towards heaven, towards the glory of heaven unshakable in our confidence in him. The record of history speaks for itself, the writer of Hebrews says. There have been many men and women who have suffered, even unto death, rather than to abandon their faith in God, their faith in Christ. They've exchanged the the passing pleasures of this world for the eternal riches of heaven. For it is by their faith, he says in verse 2, that the, the men of old, our ancestors, our forefathers, grasped at what was unseen, and they found it to be real. They found it to be true. They found that it had substance, even though they couldn't see it. And so, as a result, the writer says, they gained the approval of God. Matureo. God bore witness to them. He bore witness of them. He blessed them. They received his praise. Do we want to receive the praise of God? The one who believes. The one who puts faith Their faith and trust in Christ will receive the praise of God. But this faith isn't just for these these people in the past. This faith must be a reality 
in our lives. Because it is only through faith where we receive the true knowledge of God. Without faith, we cannot understand anything of God. By faith, verse 3 says, we understand. Noeo. We can think correctly. We can think clearly. And without faith, no matter who we are, no matter what we think that we know, we know nothing. Because we're unable to arrive at the correct conclusion concerning the things of God. We're unable to understand spiritual things. We're unable to understand eternity. And that might explain why so many schools, so many families, so many people are in such bad shape today because there is no faith. There is no faith in God. And it is by faith, the writer says, that we know these things. That we know that the worlds, the I own, the universe, the ages of time, the operation, the administration, how the universe works, the days, the years, the seasons. It is only through God that we know that. It's only through God through his word, through faith in his word, that we understand that these things were prepared, he says. Katartizo, that they were made ready, made sound, made useful by the word of God, by his rhema, by his specific commands. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. God spoke. And what happened? The universe, the world, everything within it came into existence. And we weren't there to see it. We don't know that it went that way except by faith. By faith, we believe his word. That this is the way that it happened. That when he spoke, what was, what is seen now, The result of his word, his creation, was not made. Ginomai, it didn't come into being out of the things which were visible. Nothing was visible, was it? There was nothing there except God. And he is just as real as the world that he has created. So we're warned, Colossians chapter 2. We're warned to be alert. We're warned to be on our guard, it says, that no one takes us captive. That no one kidnaps our mind through philosophy, through theories, through assumptions, which are nothing more than empty deceptions and illusion, a delusion, a delusion. For their wisdom does not come from God. It's not according to divine revelation. It's not according to Christ. And so it is not wisdom at all. Faith worships in awe at the feet of our God, the creator of the universe, while unbelief stumbles around in the dark with no real answers, with only confusion. Faith shines in a world of darkness, and of unbelief, and of violence. And that's not just our world. Look back to the beginning. Go back to the book of Genesis, the writer tells us. Adam and Eve had been driven out of the Garden of Eden because of their sin, because of their rebellion against God. And as we might expect, life was difficult outside of paradise. But life went on for them. And so in time, Eve gave birth to two children, two sons. And her firstborn was named Cain. And his younger brother was named Abel. 
We're told in Genesis that Abel was a keeper of flocks. He was a shepherd. While his brother, Cain, was a tiller of the ground. A farmer. Both respectable and important occupations. Because the crops that were raised by Cain were needed for food. While the animals that were tended and cared for by Abel were needed for sacrifices to the Lord. A reminder that sin brought death and that a blood sacrifice was required to cover sins. A picture of Christ who would one day sacrifice himself for our sin. So by faith, verse 4 says, believing God, taking God at his word on a specific day, at a specific time, in a specific place, Abel brought the sacrifice that was required by God. He brought a sacrifice, we're told, of the firstborn of his flock. He did it God's way. Well, Cain showed up with some of his produce. Maybe even the best of what he had raised. But that wasn't what God required. We can't do it our way and expect God to bless us. So we're told God accepted the sacrifice of Abel and he rejected the sacrifice of Cain. And why? Verse 4 tells us here in Hebrews 11. Because Abel offered to God, prospero, he presented to him what brought glory to God. He presented what brought glory to Christ, not what brought glory to himself. Verse 4 calls it a better sacrifice than Cain. Fusia, a blood sacrifice with greater with deeper spiritual significance through which he, that is, Abel, obtained the testimony. Matureo. He gained the approval of God. He was no better than Cain. He just did it God's way. So he received God's approval. Through faith he received an honorable testimony. Why? Because he was obedient to God. Because he was obedient to his word. He acknowledged his need for a sacrifice for the forgiveness of his sins. What about Cain? Well, he must have believed in God. Otherwise, he wouldn't have shown up with anything on that day. But like his parents, like Adam and Eve, like many people today, he didn't believe that he needed to obey God. He didn't think that was important. Oh, that's the foundation of all false teaching. That's the foundation of all false religion. We think we can come to God in our own way, with our own plan, and somehow God will bless it. But as it says in Proverbs 16.25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So by faith, Abel chose God's way, not the way of Cain, whose deeds were evil, it says in 1 John 3.12. That's why he killed his brother. He killed his brother because his deeds were evil. He knew what he was doing. He chose not to do it God's way. False religion, false teaching, always seeks to destroy the true believer, the true follower of Christ. While the true believer seeks to obey the truth that has been revealed through the word of God. And Abel was a true man of God. He submitted himself to the truth. He showed he was righteous, it says in verse 4. Dikaios, 
He was right. He was upright. He was innocent. He desired to live for God. He, he wanted to trust in God's word and to do what God said. And because of that, it was confirmed by God. God testified. He bore witness about his gifts, approving of his sacrifice. The sacrifice that he brought through faith. And though he is dead now, Verse 4 says that he still speaks. Laleo. He still proclaims a message, even from the grave. What's he saying? What is his message? Well, he's saying we can't come to God, except we come to him by faith. We can only come to him in obedience to his word. And he's saying that we can only come to God by blood. By a sacrifice for our sins. I wonder if we still hear his voice today. But the writer says, let's continue to look at the book of Genesis. We'll find more examples of faith. Look for a moment at Genesis chapter 5. The world was continuing to sink deeper and deeper into sin. The evil had covered the earth. In less than a thousand years, God would bring a devastating flood upon the earth and cover it. Why? Because the people were wicked. They had abandoned God. But, it says, two times in Genesis chapter 5, that there was a man who lived at that time, who walked with God. Halak in Hebrew. He continued to follow him. He was in fellowship with God, in communion with him. He continued down the path with God. A man who walked by faith in God. A man by the name of Enoch. Enoch submitted himself to God. And we're reminded in Amos chapter 3, verse 3, that two people can only walk together if they are in agreement that they are able to walk together. The Lord and Enoch were able to walk together. It's one heart, one mind, friendship, fellowship, love, as Enoch humbled himself before the mighty hand of God. And he walked in the light of his glory. We're told in Genesis chapter 5 that he walked with God for 300 years. That's a long time. That's a long time to walk in truth, to walk in love, to walk in obedience, to walk by faith. And from the book of Jude, Jude 14 and 15, we're told, we learn that not only did he walk with God, but he faithfully proclaimed the message of God. He proclaimed that message to all the people around him. A message of warning to the people of his generation. A message of judgment that was about to fall upon them because of their sin and their disobedience. His faith was in his heart, his faith was in his life, and his faith was on his lips, was in his words, it was in his testimony. And so, by faith, we're told, Enoch was taken up, metatithemi. He was transposed, like in music. He was moved from one key to another key. He was moved from one place to another place so that he should not see or ra'o, so he should not suffer death. He was taken from this earth without dying. And we're told, he was not found. Shurisko. He disappeared. His friends, his family, His children, 
and they have looked for him everywhere. But he was gone because God took him up and brought him home to glory. He was a young man. 365 years old, but people back then were living close to a thousand. So he was young. But the Lord took him up. Why? Says in verse 5, because he was pleasing to God. You are estheo. Because he honored him. Because he had a personal relationship with God. He trusted him. He was a man of faith. And that is the testimony that he left behind. The testimony he left to all those who saw him live his life for all those years. And we all leave a testimony behind when we go home to be with the Lord. Testimony of good or a testimony of evil. A testimony of Christ or a testimony of ourselves. And this man, Enoch, left a testimony of faith in God. And without faith, the writer says, without trust, without obedience, it is impossible. Adunatos. There is no power. There is no strength. There is no way to please God. Can it be any clearer than that? Faith is absolutely essential. It is necessary if we are to please him. For he who comes to God, proserkomai, the one who would approach him, the one who would draw near to God, must believe. Pistuo, he must have faith. We must have faith. We must be persuaded in our mind and in our heart that he is, that he is God, that he is our God who is in the heavens. Certainly his creation testifies that he is God. But we must also believe that he is not only in the heavens, but he is here among us. So sin no longer should have any place in our lives, should it? As he sees, as he dwells in the midst of us, So we should live our lives before him. We must believe that, the writer says. We must believe he is a loving God, a gracious God, a God who reaches out to us so that we might come to him. He reaches out to us through his son so we might be saved. And we must believe, the writer says in verse 6, that he is a rewarder. Misthapodotes, that he is the one who gives back. He is the one who gives blessing. He is the one who is just and fair and compassionate, the one who will let himself be found by those who diligently and who persistently seek him with their whole heart. As the Lord said in 1 Samuel 2.30, Those who honor me, I will honor. So, do we believe that? Will we take him at his word? Are we willing to put the full weight of our belief, the full weight of our confidence in him and trust him with our lives? Perhaps we've reached that fork in the road. Maybe we're at a place where we need to make that decision. The decision to really trust Christ with our lives. To come to him for forgiveness. And if we do that, then we will have true faith. The right kind of faith. Faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord.
You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.